So uh, what we're going to have now is a little bit of a discussion about oaths. Um, because oaths are something that's very important in heathenry. Oaths are something that some of you may have witnessed, some of you may have taken yourselves. Uh, we're going to be doing a sumble um, shortly after this talk. Uh, half past nine, so, and there will be a round in that where there is a possibility of making oaths. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, as a committee, we thought it was a good idea to give people a bit more information on how oaths can be done in a sensible way that's not likely to, or less likely to leave you with burdens you can't control. Um, is, is the gist of why we're doing this. So. We're going to cover um, a little bit of the history of oath making in a human context. Um, we're going to talk about things to consider uh, when making oaths. I'm going to give you some saga examples about when oath making can go wrong, uh, as a bit of a sort of a background to that. Then, yeah, cover sort of how to take an oath sensibly. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit at the end um, about some oath etiquette. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about what happens if you have made an oath and you now have no choice but to break it, but you want to be able to do that in as honourable way as possible. Um, obviously, the best thing to do is not break your oath, and that will be covered in the rest of the talk. But I know sometimes people may have made oaths without having the kind of information that I'm hopefully going to give you now, and they might get, be at the end of this talk and think, oh, bloody hell, I've shot myself in the foot here. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do in that situation as well. And then, you know, we'll have questions and discussion. I'll try and keep it a bit more interactive as well. OK, so um, a sort of a brief history of oath taking in a heathen context, because you've probably all heard heathens talking about oaths and where it comes, you know, and that it is something that is tied to heathenry. Um, so looking through the sources that we have, um, there's a few sort of common themes that we see around Hebrew oath taking. Um, oaths can be performed at any time. Um, you know, generally we do an oath round as part of our symbols. In most of the sagas, uh, Yule is seen as a time for oath taking. Um, that's the time of the year where most oaths in sagas take place, but they do take place at uh, other times as well, but you all seem to be a really popular time to be doing this. And that might be because, you know, it's just the time when everyone's together inside because you can't be outside doing stuff. So it's a good opportunity. You're having these discussions. Um, or it could be that there's some more spiritual connection to that time of year. Sadly, the sources don't say that. All the sources say is these oaths were sworn at you. They don't say why. Um, so we've kind of got to try and infer that ourselves. Um, oaths are often in the sagas sworn on a sacred object. Now, the two most common sacred objects that oaths are sworn on is an armory. So this is actually my kindred's oath ring. Um, and whenever we make specific to the kindred oaths, they are made on this oath ring. Um, and we have um, Icelandic sources saying about how the oath ring was worn by the Gothi when it wasn't being used for overtaking so that's the practice that we follow within our kindred i wear the oath ring and then when we need to swear oaths on it it's passed around the relevant people so we're following that icelandic practice there and um, that might not be too much of a surprise and um, if you think about a modern context where we swear an oath on a ring you know it's a finger ring rather than an arm ring but marriage and that idea of a ring symbolizing a commitment an oath looking at it historically has kind of morphed from this swearing an oath on the Gophi's arm ring to a wedding ring being a symbol of your oath. So it's not too dissimilar. And the other one most common sacred object may be slightly more surprising because it is a boar. And in most cases, an actual living boar, um, often soon to be sacrificed. But at the point of the oath taking, um, oaths were sworn on a boar, normally on the bristles of the boar specifically. Um, so war bands would place their hands upon the bristles of the boar when they were making their oaths. Again, we're not given in the sources a context as to why we have to try and infer that ourselves. Now, 
one of the reasons this could have been uh, could be to do with deities who are often invoked when making oaths. Um, and Frey is a very common one. Um, it, Frey is the most attested deity that oaths are sworn in the presence of. And Frey has a golden boar that he rides, he's connected with boars. Um, so it could be that that's why they swore the oaths on the boar, because that then made it more sacred to Frey. Um, but Frey is not the only god that is mentioned when it comes to invoking uh, oaths. Um, there are mentions of Tyr uh, in oath taking. It's one of the sort of rare things where we have a mention of Ulla, because Ulla gets left out of a lot of things. But Ulla is a god that has um, relevance to oath taking as well. Um, and there is, I think there's only one attestation of Thor being invoked for uh, oath taking. But there were different deities, and I suppose it would generally have revolved around which deities were more important to that particular tribe. Uh, but it does seem to be the common theme is that Frey, Tyr and Ulla are the ones that are kind of most often invoked. Um, something else that's sort of quite interesting in this historical context is that this seems to be going on in a vaguely similar way throughout the Germanic heathen world. Um, so we don't just have Old Norse sources talking about these practices. There are very, very similar practices going on amongst pagan Anglo-Saxons um, and amongst the Germanic tribes recorded by Tacitus. So it's a common theme throughout sort of the heathen scope in terms of geography and time. Um, and there are small differences between the practices, exactly how they do the oaths, but generally quite similar through all of it. So it's a sort of pan-Germanic, pan-heathen thing. Um, so I've got a few um, sort of examples of what we do have from um, Helga Fifer Hjorvard Sonnesaga. Uh, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, that evening, the great vows were taken. The sacred boar was brought in. The men laid their hands thereon and took their vows at the king's toast. So that is describing the use of the boar. Again, it gives us a tantalising bit of information. It leaves us with many more questions. We don't know what the oaths were. We don't know what they swore. We don't know what their words were. We don't know why the sacred boar was brought in. So we've got to kind of try and fill in the gaps. Um, Hervara Saga Ockhethix. Uh, the biggest boar available was to be given to Frey. They considered it so holy that over its bristles uh, be sworn all oaths of great importance. So again, it's talking about the particularly important oaths are being sworn on this boar. So does that mean that less important oaths could be sworn on other things? We're only hearing about these most important oaths being sworn upon a boar, which has already been marked to be given to Frey. So is there a connection there that when you swear the oath on the boar, that boar is then given to Frey and maybe your message is then transmitted via that object, potentially. So things to consider, and this is where we sort of start drifting between these historical examples and overtaking as modern heathens today. Now, one of the things that I'm sure draws most of you to heathenry is we are non-dogmatic. We don't really have many rules at all. We have no universally agreed rules. Um, we don't really have very many rules at all that are even generally agreed upon. Um, but one of the very few rules that we do generally all agree on is that you honour your oaths. Um, and you don't want to be an oath breaker. Um, because as heathens, we consider that our word is our bond. And lying is something that, you know, we don't want to do. Keeping secrets in certain contexts has to be done uh, <laughs> for, uh, for reasons. But, you know, we, we, we avoid lying, but breaking an oath is like an extra layer on top of that. Because when you make an oath, you are saying, I am definitely going to do this thing. You are effectively staking your reputation on it. If you break your oath, it then means that you are not a trustworthy person. And if you're a trustworthy person, how can you be a full, fully engaged and looked after member of the community if the rest of the community can't? trust your word. So as I say, whilst we have very, very few rules, 
And it's not like, oh, if you break, you know, if you're burned for all eternity. It's, <laughs> it's the standard heathen thing. And I say it with the Havamal all the time. The Havamal doesn't say, do these things, don't do these things, or you'll burn for all eternity. It says, do these things, don't do these things, or everyone will think you're a dick. <laughs> um, and that is basically what's going on with the oath breaking. So, I mean, if you've sworn it and you, a god has been invoked to witness it, you may well invoke their wrath, but realistically what you're looking at is you're going to be shunned from the community and you're not going to be trusted. And, you know, this community looks after each other, we trust each other, and you're effectively risking ostracising yourself from that by breaking your oaths. So, basically, the, the, the crux of what to take away from that is don't take oaths lightly. And that's what we're going to go into a little bit more in a bit. You know, it can be very tempting um, when we're doing something like a sumble, and there is that opportunity there to make an oath. And maybe the two or three people before you have all made an oath and you think, oh, shit, I need to make an oath. So you just make something up on the fly. Please don't do that. It's for your own good. It's not it's not a good thing to do. Oath, like when you have a symbol and there's an oath making round, I would suggest you only make an oath if you have gone to that symbol with that purpose in mind. Don't make oaths on the fly because it doesn't go well. And I can give you some historical saga examples of why that doesn't go well. This is one is Yom's Vikinga saga. Um, so Sigvaldi, who is like the head of the Yom's Vikings, makes an oath. And then the saga follows. Basically, everybody else around the Sunball decides that not only do they need to make an oath, but they need to promise bigger things. Sigvaldi's already promised something, you know, fairly extreme, like he's going to take a city. And then the next person's like, well, I'm going to take an entire country. And then the next person's like, I am going to take an entire country and bed every woman in it. Uh, and it just, you know, it goes on like that. And of course, certainly by the ones at the end, once they've had to warn up, you know, 10 different people, their oaths are completely unachievable. Um, and the saga basically then follows them failing to be able to keep their oaths and all the bad things that happen to them as a consequence. And in the sagas, obviously, the bad things include, you know, intervention from gods. They include like, you know, they get struck by lightning or, or whatever, stuff like that. You can decide if you think that would happen to you or not now. But the point of the saga is when that, that particular part of the saga is, I think, to demonstrate don't take oaths lightly. Don't just start promising to do ridiculous things because you've basically got into a pissing contest. Um, because, yeah, that's not what <coughs> oath-taking is about. Oath-taking should be considered and it should be, you know, not done on the fly. And not, like, in the round in somebody, it's quite often toasts, oaths, oaths and boasts. And I think what's happened there in Yom's Lickinga saga is the guys have kind of mixed oaths, oaths and boasts together, made boastful oaths. I'm glad I don't drink anymore. <laughs> <laughs> made boastful oaths which have then backfired upon them. Can you um, say that ten times fast? Yeah. <laughs> no, I will not oath to do it. <laughs> um, so another really good example that I think sort of demonstrates consequences um, that might have been unforeseen from making oaths without putting conditions upon them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about putting conditions on your oath. Um, it comes from Drachenkal's saga Freyskofa. Um, and I don't know if any of you have read it, but effectively what happens in this saga is there's this guy, uh, Drachenkal, who is a Freyskofa, so a gofi of Thray. Um, and he has a horse which he thinks is a very good horse. His horse is called Frey Faxi. So again, he's a Frey's Gofi. His horse is dedicated to Frey. And he says that only me and Frey are allowed to ride this horse. And if anybody else rides this horse, I'm going to kill them. And then his favourite thrall, who he gets on really well with, he's actually planning to like make a free man very soon and all the rest of it, doesn't know about this oath, rides the horse. Oh. Yeah, and uh, Raphael then kills him because he has to, he's oath sworn, 
And then he speaks some very telling words, which I think, you know, when thinking about oaths, this little passage that he says should probably be kept in mind. So, often we shall repent when we speak too much, but seldom we would rue it if we spoke less. Yeah. So, again, don't make oaths for the sake. I mean, you can apply this in a wider context. Don't just talk for the sake of it. But... So, often we shall repent when we speak too much. So, often speaking too much will be bad. But seldom we would rue it if we spoke less. So you, you very rarely regret not speaking, but you quite often regret speaking. And that's not saying we shouldn't speak, but it's saying like, because this is very much in a context where his oath has backfired and he'd have to, he's had to kill someone he really liked. Yeah, very similar lines in the Habermas as well. Yeah, there are very similar lines in the Habermas as well. Um, no, that's not in there, probably. <laughs> But no, there, there's, you know, there's the things about the unwise man should not speak in the company of wise men and that sort of thing. Um, it's that same thing, you know, going back to just because in the sun wall other people have made an oath, don't feel like you have to. Like, you don't. So, um, now we're going to get into how we can apply this practically and we can sort of look at this through our, if anybody does choose to make any oaths later try and keep these things in mind as i said they're not rules we're not non-dogmatic this is kind of like dan's quick and dirty guide to not making terrible oaths that will ruin your life <laughs> so the first one and i've kind of mentioned it quite a lot already you don't need to take a lot of oaths like i could count the number of oaths i've taken on one hand uh so my wedding vows uh my oath to my country when i joined the military my oath to my kindred, my oath to Jack as sworn brothers, um, and I think that's it, so four in my whole life. Um, so, you know, every time there's a sun ball, you don't need to be swearing an oath. I've only made four and they were for big important things. And, you know, that's, that's just me, obviously, but, you know, just to demonstrate that, you know, I go to a lot of sun balls and I don't make an oath for everyone. I've only made four in my whole life. Um, so yeah, you don't need, don't feel like you ever have to make an oath. If you make an oath, it should be because you want to make an oath, not just because you feel it. Don't make oaths on the fly. Again, very much tied in because, and the things I'll go into in a bit, like you want to make sure your oath is considered. And whilst the thing, you know, you might just be in a sun you're like, oh yeah, I want to oath this. And you might well want to oath that, and that's great. But you don't then give yourself the time and the opportunity to think it through to put stipulations in, to think about, well, what could actually stop me from doing this thing that I've oathed? So don't make oaths on the fly, think about them. If you're gonna do an oath at a symbol, have it planned out in advance. If you haven't planned it out in advance, and you think, oh, I'd really like to make this oath, maybe think, well, there'll be another symbol. I'll think about it, and next symbol, I'll do it then. Yeah, the lesson from Jung's Vikinga saga, don't get into an oath pissing contest. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very silly idea. Don't do it. Think about your oaths carefully before you make them. Um, again, kind of going over what I've said. Now, uh, this next one I think is really important because it's how that you how you can apply that thinking about it, apply that thinking about the factors that might stop you doing it that are outside of your control to make the wording of your oath have stipulations. So this isn't about putting in like a whole page of terms and conditions, which basically means that your oath is meaningless because then what's the point in making it? It'll be very, you know, it's pointless then. But it's little things that you can do. So oaths that can be renewed is a really good thing to do. So if, for example, um, I use alcohol as an example. So you are, you want to quit drinking, you're struggling with alcohol. Say, I will not drink alcohol for one year in one year's time you can always add another year on you know because you can always extend a time period but you can't reduce it if you say i will never drink alcohol again then if 10 years time you have a drink you're an oath breaker if you say i will not drink alcohol for one year then in one year's time you're like actually i'd quite like a drink now fine you're not an oath breaker if you're like no i'm still committed to this and like some people do this with like wedding vows. They commit to each other 
And then every year they renew that oath to each other. And then that's a way of doing it so that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in our lives. You might, something, you might drive a wedge between you and you don't want to end up staying together forever because of an oath. Because again, that still ruins your life, hasn't it? But, you know, you might both be much happier if you split up. So if you put that context on there and say, you know, we will renew this every year, then you've given yourself, it's still a commitment, a year's a long time, but you, you have got that out. Um, another thing you can do is say, for like, as long as I am able to. And because then again, you could say, well, that's a cop out, but it's not because you have to be honest with yourself about if you are able to. So an example I've got here, just scribbling down some notes, you could say something like, I will perform a bloat every day as long as I'm physically able to. Because if you just say, I will perform a bloat every day of my life, and then you slip into a coma, you've broken your oath. And that, you know, wouldn't be great. You're already in a coma, that's bad enough. Um, or, you know, without being an oath breaker on top of it. But like, that's quite an extreme example. But, you know, it might be like, I physically can't do a bloke because I'm like so cripplingly ill with flu that I can't move. And then, you know, again, being cripplingly ill with flu is bad and being an oath breaker on top of that is you really don't want that. So just it's just little things like that. So, yeah, I will perform a lot every day that I am able to. And then it's on you. You know, if you could take the piss and just be like, oh, I'm a bit tired, so I'm not able to. But that that's between you and the gods and your ancestors and your community, you know, how much you value your reputation um, and your connection with the ancestors and the deities and everything else. So it is putting something on there, but it's not stripping all the value out of it. It's still a sacred oath, but it's lessening its potential to ruin your life if for some unforeseen circumstance you can't do it. Um, as I said, you can always extend your oaths. You can always add to them, but you can never take away. So if I stood up and made an oath that I will do a block every day, I can't then, and I do, and with nothing else on it, I can't then six months later go, oh no, actually I'll do a block every two days. Like you can't, you can never make it less. You can add to it though. So, you know, start small and build up. Do a trial oath, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> test it out. Um, but yeah, once you've made it, it's much, much harder to take it back or reduce it. So again, just sort of think about it before you do it. Yeah, I'd also say probably don't make oaths when you're really drunk or really high or really tired <laughs> or, you know. Having a very, very good day. Yeah, or having a really, really good day as well, though. Yeah. Eh? Like, you know, don't do it when you're in sort of altered states. Um, you know, try and do it when you're clear headed. Again, because, you know, once we've all had a few drinks, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do this thing. And you wake up the next morning like, there's no way I could possibly do that thing. So before I sort of open it up for questions or discussion, there's a few other little points that I want to make that are kind of subsidiary to oath taking, but I think they are very, very relevant. And actually they've sort of come up recently within the community. Um, so the first one is who can you talk about an oath with? Now, Oaths can be very, very personal, but we take them generally in a symbol. So this has different implications. So one of those things is that when you make an oath in front of those people, those people are witnesses to that oath. So if you break that oath, you are accountable to them. Now, I know some people will say that if you break that oath, you bring dishonour about upon all the other people. I wouldn't agree with that because we often stumble with people we don't know that well. And, you know, I'm sure you guys are all lovely, but if I don't know you, I ain't staking my reputation on words I don't know that you're going to say. So I don't agree with that. But those, everyone that said that stumble is a witness and they can help hold you accountable if you do break that oath. They can also be really helpful to help keep you on track. Um, you know, if it's done in the right way, like if you are a witness to an oath and you see someone like they've put a time limit on something like I will do something by this time. And you're a witness to that oath and you see that they're struggling to do that. The more honourable thing to do is rather than wait for the clock to sit down and go, oath breaker, <laughs> maybe help them in the run up to that. Just be like, you know, 
Remember you swore this oath, you know, time's ticking. Have you thought about how you're going to do this? Give them some prompts, help them out. Don't just like, yeah, let the world burn. And so that that's one side of it. Um, but the other side of it that I think is really, really important is just because you are a witness to an oath, these things are still very, very personal. If someone swears an oath in some book, you do not then, as a witness, have the right to go and talk about that outside of that group of people. Mm -hmm. Because, as I say, it's very, very personal. And sadly, there have been incidences where people haven't thought about this. They've witnessed someone's oath in some ball, and then they've gone and talked about it with someone else who wasn't in the some ball, And that's had knock-on negative consequences. And in some cases, friendships have been broken, understandably. And um, so it's just that, again, that little bit of a thing about making an oath is sacred, but witnessing an oath is also sacred. Yeah, it's and integrity. It is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's integrity. You have got responsibility as a witness as well as, and, you know, if they then do break their oath, it's then, you know, valid for you to call them out on it. Absolutely. But what's never OK is gossiping about oaths because it's very personal um, you know, it can be difficult things to talk about. Uh, I mean, generally, that goes for like the whole of Sumble. Like anything that's discussed, you know, it's going to sound really corny, but you know, what happens in Sumble stays in Sumble. <laughs> we, but in Sumble, we do. We really, a lot of us will really open ourselves up and we'll talk about some deep, heartfelt stuff. And that should always be on the understanding that that doesn't then go and get gossiped about. Um, and the Havamel definitely covers that. So now the other one is oath breaking um, but I'm going to split this a little bit because again if someone willfully breaks an oath you know if someone uses oath breaking uh, making the oath to try and sort of manipulate people into trusting them with like no intention of ever honoring it or they think oh yeah I've made this oath but sod it um, you know that's obviously bad and as witnesses to that oath you are well within your rights to call them out for it um, and, you know, is it, you probably still don't go around gossiping with people who weren't in the sumble and being like, oh, yeah, matey boy's not trustworthy. But it's perfectly valid if you've witnessed someone, what well, someone's oath and they've broken that oath to be like, look, I don't trust you because you're an oath breaker. And, um, you know, that's valid. The heathenry isn't all pink and fluffy. Like, you know, if people are oath breakers, they're oath breakers. You don't have to trust them. Like, you know saying sorry isn't necessarily enough for us like your actions have meanings and your words have meanings but the other side of oath breaking is where maybe someone has been a little bit silly they've made an oath without thinking it through properly and there's nothing there's no sort of willful malice but they end up breaking an oath and so i've been going through all of this about you know how to make sense of our lives and there may well be people sat in this room thinking shit <laughs> i didn't do any of that and i'm now an oath breaker and i don't want to be an oath breaker nobody does so what i would say is if it's that kind of circumstance obviously you know hopefully now you've been armed with a few tools and we'll have a bit more discussion with it as well but that that won't happen but if you know before you thought about it properly you had made an oath or you know, a completely left field things happened, which you could never have envisaged. Technically, you've broken your oath and you're an oath breaker. So what can we do in that sort of scenario? Um, and I would say it really depends on individuals. It depends on the circumstances. We're not being judged with hellfire. We're being judged by our friends, our comrades, our ancestors, in some cases, our gods as well. As heathens, generally, we're quite good at seeing that things are nuanced. Um, there are like different levels of being an oath breaker. Being a willfully malicious oath breaker, always bad. Other circumstances, it might be, well, you know, there's things we can retrospectively do. Um, you know, you may have made a slightly frivolous oath um, and you've not been able to keep it. But there might be an opportunity to sort of mitigate it a bit, you know, to make up for it. So say you've sworn an oath to do something for someone. And for whatever reason, 
unless you just had no intention of doing it in the first place, in which case, yeah, you're an oath breaker and I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason it just hasn't happened, that oath is kind of between you and that person. And you, you know, if that person is a reasonable person, you should be able to have a discussion with them and say like, you know, I swore this oath to you. I've not been able to keep it. Let me make it up to you. And again, sort of under heathen values, just saying sorry isn't normally, you know, oh, all is forgiven. It's make it up to them, actually do something to make it up to them. Try and make it something that is equivalent in value to the thing that you hope to do. If you can do something that's even more value than the thing you're hope to do, even better. Yeah. You know, we're not just like, oh, sorry, I broke my oath. You know, that's not, not really it. And that, again, that can apply not just to if you've sworn an oath to your friends or family. That can even apply all the way up to if you've sworn an oath to a deity. Now, obviously, I can't sit here and say, yeah, Odin will be cool with it, mate. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is, again, yeah. yeah, I mean, if it's Odin, he probably won't be cool. <laughs> Some of you guys, but he won't. Um, <laughs> But there's other deities whereby maybe, you know, you've got that personal connection and, you know, it, it obviously it's a lot easier to, if it's a friend, it's much, much easier to have a conversation with them where they can be like, yeah, okay, it's cool if you do this. Obviously, communicating with deities is slightly harder, you know, they don't just talk back to us in, you know, you can't get them on the phone. Um, but you know, that then goes down to you and your connection with that deity. You know, what can you do to them, to make it up to them? And, you know, you might never know if what you've done is enough. You might get a sign. You might get something to say that you feel like, okay, I made, I mean, if it's Thor, Thor's generally quite a chill dude with these sorts of things, I find. So, like, I would still definitely, like, do not set out to break an oath to Thor, like, you know, hammer itty um, but you know he's the guardian of mankind he's more likely to be understanding than odin odin yeah no <laughs> not yeah really super try hard not to break oaths to odin try, try super hard not to break oaths at all but definitely with him um but with thor you know if and let's say it might be you go your whole life and you never know if you've made it up to him or not Maybe you'll find out when you move on. Maybe you won't. Or, you know, maybe you will get a nice clear message. Something will happen that's very much like, OK, I think, you know, go back to Thor as our example. You might get some like a very distinct sign from Thor that feels quite positive, And then you can take that as, OK, I think I've made it up to him. I'm going to learn from my mistakes and be more careful with my oaths in the future. Obviously, I cannot tell you what deities are saying and what they're going to accept and what they're not going to accept. But what I'm saying is, if you have put yourself in a position where you've made an oath that you, maybe you didn't think through, maybe you made it when you were drunk, let's say maybe just some crazy thing has happened in your life. Like you were like, you swore to run a marathon and then your legs stopped working. Um, you know, things happen. They do. Like, um, so it's all about trying to say volunteered for nervous and climbing Ben Nevis. I don't give a shit if your legs don't <laughs> You are going to, there you go. So Steve, yeah. Yeah. Steve is in the Odin school of the <laughs> I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so what if I do my hamstring on day before? Well, we will oh. drag you up Limp. there on a stretcher. <laughs> ah, but, but there we go. There we go into where as a witness to an oath, I know it's a sort of, you know, jokey example, but again, it's like rather than waiting until the day after Brian was supposed to go up Nevis and call him an oath breaker, maybe let's carry him up, you know, help him. You know, there's things we can do. We help each other. But then let me just remind you, you will become a burden. <laughs> <laughs> burden, Brian. Okay, there we go. That's the um, So I've kind of covered everything I want to say, and I think I've kind of banged on about my points enough. Um, so what I'd like to do now is sort of open up to the floor. Either you can ask me any questions, or if you feel like you've got something you want to share with the group, uh, that's also good. So yeah, has anyone got any questions or further points they'd like to add? Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a bunch, so I can bombard you. Cool, so, yeah, we can take notes. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's always Kieran. Uh, it's always Kieran. Like, uh, <laughs> and somehow they keep themselves making that still within the group. Um, that the, the Earth Prince wants to. 
but as part of the community, you know, I have a responsibility to make the rest of the community aware of untrustworthy people. Yeah, and that's that is a good point. So when I yeah, so I said that like obviously we don't gossip about people though whilst they're active, and I said maybe don't talk about it outside their group. But okay. I mean, it, it really again it goes down to context. Um, if someone has really you know messed up and been a really untrustworthy person, and it becomes immediately clear that they never meant to keep their oath. Uh, you know, maybe they've broken it in a way that has knock-on consequences. Um, then, yeah, I would say, maybe not shouting about it, but just like, you know, if it comes up, you know, if, say, for example, um, I won't give anyone any names, mm -hmm. we'll say person X has broken an oath and it's, you know, it's not because of something outside of their control, but it's, it's a willful oath breaking. And you were a witness to that. And then someone comes to you and said, oh, um, I was thinking of going into business with person X. Yeah. Then that would definitely be a situation where you would be perfectly justified in saying, well, my experience of this person is this. Yeah. Like, I probably wouldn't, I mean, in, unless it's some like mad, horrendous context, I probably wouldn't, as soon as the oath's broken, go and plaster it all over the internet <laughs> and like run a campaign of character assassination. Yeah. Uh, you know, that might be a bit much, uh, but sort of, you know, quietly and sensibly. And again, it's all down to the nuance of the situation and what you feel is appropriate. But yes. Yeah, well, that, that... yeah I, I think that's a really good point. And I think it's interesting in what you've said, you've kind of, you started off with, I'm an oath breaker, but then actually, like for how you've described it, I wouldn't say you're an oath breaker at all. But again, even then, if it's a personal oath and you're only making that oath to yourself, the only person you have to reconcile that with is yourself. You know, if you've sworn it to somebody else, you'd have to reconcile it with them. But if you've sworn it to yourself, as long as you can reconcile it within yourself. But as I say, in that specific example that you give, I wouldn't have said that was oath breaking at all, personally. Other people may do. I wouldn't, but yeah. So I think that's a really good point. Well, you can reconcile an oath with the other person. Like you know, if you've made an oath to stay married until you die, but you're both like, yeah, actually, let's not. That oath is only to that other person. Yeah. So if they can release you from it, that's fine. If you swore to a deity that you would stay with that person forever, then that complicates it. You've got to get the deity's permission as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, divorce is a really good example, and actually. It's a really good heathen example because when we look back at the sagas, we don't know what words were spoken in a heathen marriage ceremony, but we do know that oaths were taken very, very seriously. And we also know that divorce was commonplace and wasn't shunned. So the implication there is that when they were making their marriage vows, they must have had stipulations and get out things in there. They must have said, you know, I will stay with you forever so long as we both love each other or something yeah, like that. More of an oath to each other. Yeah, well. exactly. Yeah, you're only yeah, reconciling yeah. it with each other. Yeah. But the witness was a deity you don't believe in, so you can't reconcile the deity you don't believe in, therefore... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, if, if you've been forced to swear an oath to something that you don't... Yeah, like a, if you've made an oath to a deity you don't believe in, then within yourself you can't possibly think there's going to be any punishment from something that doesn't exist so yeah you're all good <laughs> as heathens we want our word to be our bond so we don't ever want in the ideal world you don't ever want to go back on anything you say but there are definitely different levels if i just say like i don't know sabi says to me will you take the bin out and then i forget to take the bin out I wouldn't say that classes as being an oath breaker. Yeah, could, could like, you yeah, like, I mean, I hope not, because I regularly forget to do things. Um, I think where where it sort of comes in is that, you know, if you've done it in ritual, then you're talking about that more serious level. If you've just said, yeah, I'll meet you at the pub, and then you don't meet someone at the pub, it's still not great, you know, you've still broken a promise i'd say that's not you broken a promise and broken an oath if in the sumble you hold the arm ring or swear on the boards of, of the bristles of the boar that you will meet them at the pub at that time and you don't then that's far more serious i mean that'd be a very weird oath to take but just you know, using that example 
Um, is yeah, it's the intent you put into it and how that is manifested through the ritualistic way in which you do it. So I'm I'm unlikely to trip over and make an oath without being aware of no, that. No, exactly. Uh, it's that <laughs> intention behind it. Yeah, yeah, and that that is a very very good thing to bring out. Just saying that you'll do something isn't an oath. Like again, you want to keep your word, but it's not an oath. An oath is where you swear to do something you know and there is a, a willful intent of i want people to witness in most cases or it could be an oath to yourself but you, you know you're saying to yourself i am taking this very very seriously this isn't just uh i'd like to do this thing or you know new year's resolution i'm going to go to the gym it, it's a but again if you really wanted to push yourself you could do that you could stand up at some ball and swear an oath that you will go to the gym I would recommend again you put stipulations on it like i will go to the gym as long as i'm not in hospital or you know whatever as long as i'm capable of going to the gym i'll go to the gym i think that does play in and it goes back to kind of what i was saying about how you know we don't have a lot of rules but this is one that we kind of do have yeah again the hell's another day you probably don't want to go breaking oaths too because you know she can't just ruin your life she can ruin your afterlife <laughs> Um, so yeah, that for anyone that doesn't know, there is this concept of there is kind of like a punishment afterlife for oath breakers. Now, my sort of UPG around that would be that that's for like you know the really bad oath breakers. That's not just like for you don't people. Get any contact in the passage, no, it? you don't get any context just... in the passage at all. It's just like if you're an oath breaker, you will have this horrible afterlife where you'll get gnawed on by worms and stuff. But you know, I'm personally sort of reading the other sources around it and everything else and our sort of general heathen understanding of what afterlifes are and how it works. We're not generally about punishment and we're definitely not about punishment for mistakes. Um, again, if you are a willful oath breaker and you like, I don't know, you swear an oath to protect someone and then you shoot them, you know, <laughs> that you've you've betrayed someone's trust you've harmed them you've used that oath deliberately to do harm then potentially if that punishment afterlife does exist then i would say that's the kind of oath breaker that would go there that willful uh malice that using an oath to manipulate someone and get what you want and harm them in the process if it's anything it would be that i don't think you promise yourself something you know i think it's about the damage it does to other people the damage it does to the community the damage it does to the gods i hope that was useful to everybody i hope maybe you know you think about our oaths <laughs> some will in 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs>